wanted to take you through the fundamentals of blockchain technology and crypto and coins. Um, how well do you understand blockchain and its implementations? I know I don't understand it, but that's why I've brought two fantastic experts here to go over exactly what blockchain is all about. I have John and Sam. And John, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Beth. It's a real pleasure to join you. And a really hot afternoon, as you say, here in the UK. Um, the name's John Palfreyman. Um, up to about four years ago, I used to work uh, for IBM. And I worked for IBM for the last past 20 years before that. But the uh, the last four or so years of my time with IBM, I spent, spent on business blockchain. Um, since I left IBM, I've been doing what people call a portfolio career. Um, combining lots of different things from consultancy to some writing. I've published a couple of books, uh, also lecturing uh, with uh, Leeds University Business School and Salford University as well. So keeping myself busy. Fantastic. Thanks, John. And Sam? Uh, yes. So uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining on. Um, as you might note by my accent, uh, I'm originally from Melbourne in Australia, but uh, based in the UK here. So 30 degrees is just a kind of tepid, warm day for me. Uh, I wouldn't call it necessarily hot, um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah. Look, my experience with all of this, I'm I'm actually a, um, a financial uh, advisor and researcher and analyst by trade, um, but my involvement with uh, with blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies goes back to 2010 when I sort of first stumbled across Bitcoin in an online forum. Um, and when you go down that rabbit hole, you you never come out. So I've spent the better part of of a decade now, of over a decade now, um, involved in researching, understanding, investing, um, advising people on cryptocurrencies, the crypto economy, how it all works, how it comes together, how people can use it, the ups, the downs, the risks, all, all the things that, that come with this exploding uh, area of, of fascination for a lot of people. Um, and in, in 2016, I actually wrote a book um, about it all, about, about how we got here where we'd come from, where I think we were probably going with it. Um, we updated that again in 2019. That's been quite well received. I think we I think we've published that to about 40,000 people around the world in a couple of different languages. I think we just, just had it translated into Spanish um, for all the Spanish speakers out there. So there's, there's probably a version out there for everyone. Um, but yeah, so I'm excited to, to talk to everyone about and try and keep the, the basics of, 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 I guess, how we got here, what crypto is about, why, why this, you know, we're even talking about this today. Uh, and how it can apply to to sport, how it can apply to all kinds of industry and, and, and people and individuals, and I guess what I call the crypto revolution and how it's going to sort of shape our future as well. And I hope you guys can see already from the conversations I've had with John and Sam over the past couple of weeks, these guys have a real passion for this. And I've already learned quite a bit from speaking to these two. So this is why this session is so crucial. And I love the fact we've already got a question coming in already, which we'll get to further on in the discussion. But these guys have been involved in this for the last God knows how long. I'm sure they'll get into more detail about it. But this is what this session is all about, is learning about how we can apply things in our industry right now. Um, so when we were speaking earlier on, guys, um, we thought we know that blockchain has been around for a long time. So why is it still viewed as many as an emerging technology? Um, we've used the word this, a phenomenon coming through in the sport industry, but it's been around for so long. Why is it taken till now? Do you want me to get started with that, Sam? Yeah, go on, John. You yeah, you take it away. It's, it's a, um, well, we, the trouble is we've both got stuff to say about all of these questions. I mean, it, it, yeah, all the component technologies of blockchain have been around for ages. I mean, if you look at blockchain, it's really interesting because it actually does plug together lots of component technologies. You know, starting from file sharing technology um, that was pioneered in Napster back in 1999, but also it includes privacy services, which incorporates a science called cryptography. And you can trace that back to the time of the Egyptians, right about 1900 BC. And in fact, the first use of cryptography, one of the early uses, was to, to actually secure a recipe for pottery glaze back in the 1500 BC. So you can see that sort of components of technology have been around for some time, but clearly in a computational context, um, you know, we need to wind the clock forward to, to around about the 1970s when computer security started to be you know, really taken very seriously. And in fact, my, my old employer, IBM, used to uh, actually started the world's first crypto group in the early 70s, looking at securing customer data, you know, very fundamental thing. Then all the components really moved forward to the, when, when uh, Bitcoin was, was created and essentially 
blockchains are technology that underpins Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is a very special use case um, that was really created around people's you know, loss of trust in central financial institutions around the time of the financial crisis of 2008. Um, it was first used as a, um, first taken, you know, as a, as a donation for WikiLeaks as an organization back in 2011. So, you know, the cryptocurrency part of blockchain has been around since that, since that sort of era. Rolling the clock forward again to when, when I started to get involved, around about 2015, this is where people started to say, let's look at the technology underneath Bitcoin, the stuff called blockchain, and let's look at applying it to different business use cases. And essentially, we're, Beth, we're still on that journey. We're sort of finding new use cases all the time to apply it to. Some are quite mature because they've been going on for several years. Some are really new, like, you know, NFTs in sport. So fascinating journey. I'm so sure what, Sam would like to add some define, stuff. No? <laughs> how would you define what Bitcoin is? I'm trying to make sure that there's so many different technical terms yeah. that I know you guys will be so used to saying, but what, what, is, what is Bitcoin? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's a load of different ways that we can a- approach this. Um, when I mean, John, John's right. There are a few key terms, really, that he the, he made a, a point about. So we're talking about peers. We're talking about security. We're talking about um, computing networks. And fundamentally, that's what blockchain technology is. It, it's it's a network um, between peers, whether those are, are public peers or private peers. Um, and and it's a network. It's it's a data network. It can be a monetary network. Um, it can hold many different forms. So, the, one of the things that irks me is when somebody talks about the blockchain in the singular. Uh, in reality, when we look at this space, there are a number of different blockchains, um, and and there are some networks that that are involved with uh, data sharing or file sharing. John John mentioned um, monetary networks that don't even use blockchain technology, but are still fundamentally. Uh, computational and peer networks. So that's kind of the the guts of what we're really talking about. And, and I remember when Sandy uh, was talking to us earlier off off site, and he said, "No one really cares about how how email works or how the internet works. Like no one really knows what the internet protocols are that mean we can even do this event. They just want to know that they can use it." And I think where we get tripped up sometimes at the moment with a lot of this around cryptocurrencies is trying to explain to people the underlying technology. It's like, that's not really what people want to know. They want to know how they can use it, what it means, um, and how they can utilize it either for themselves, for their organizations, uh, or for their networks. And I think that's something to really focus on with this is that when we talk about NFTs or we talk about Bitcoin, you need to look at what is the network? What does the network represent in this sense? So when we talk about something like Bitcoin, Originally, uh, it is it is designed to be a, a medium of exchange. It is it is a payment, uh, a monetary network, um, and that's how it's sort of started. And it's evolved into something that some would consider a store of value. Uh, some would consider property. And I guess the thing around Bitcoin, what it's sparked, its genesis, and and the, the subsequent ten years, eleven years now, um, twelve uh, that, that have come off the back of it, is that it's not something that we've ever had before really in terms of it's not it's not money it's not property it's not shares it's not equity but it could and can be all of the above and it's when we're starting to look at new concepts and ideas around what money is what assets are how people can and should be able to transact those around the world then we we, we're, we're cutting new ground really and so everyone's really finding their feet in this industry and and i think people shouldn't expect to know everything um, but draw on the expertise of those who can help guide them in this space uh, around what it will yeah. So, You know, when it comes to Bitcoin, some people see it as money. I've used it as money before. Uh, I also use it as a store of value. Um, you know, I've paid for things with it. I've, I've stored it. I've got some, uh, like many other different cryptocurrencies as well. So there are many use cases. There are many different blockchains. It can get very confusing, but, um, you know, it, 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 you can cut through the noise as well. Mm. Yeah, you really can. Sam, just to add to that, I mean, I think that's that's great. And, and I think, you know, I go back to 2016 when I sort of really started digging into blockchain. And it was a time when, you know, business blockchain was at its most hyped. Um, <laughs> yeah, sort of people, people would, in fact, people would say, you know, I, I used to joke, people were sort of saying, you know, 
blockchain's the answer, what's the question? And, you know, clearly that's nonsense. I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is just like any other technology. It really comes to life and really adds value when you apply it to the right use case. And as, as Sam, you were sort of starting to say, you know, it's all about finding that right use case and then finding the right sort of blockchain to address that use case. And then, you know, understanding how it needs to be rolled out across the different types of network. So those are they're, they're important considerations that you just need to work through if you're thinking about blockchain for a particular solution. Yeah, I remember around that time that um, I went to a few um, large financial conferences um, and the banking industry was incredibly dismissive of uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain technology. And they were talking about using it for things like, you know, and they were starting and still do develop private networks where they're all you know, able to use it to transfer um, value and, and different data and assets between themselves. Um, and that's obviously somewhat changed uh, in the last few years as well. And I think one of the things that keeps coming back, uh, and, and I guess it's also one of the probably biggest distractions from the actual uh, underlying development that's happening in this space is that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, or, or Binance coin or whatever the coin is that might might exist, um, it can be converted into, into fiat currencies. It can be converted into to pounds, to dollars, to whatever. And so the major focus for a lot of people is what are these cryptocurrencies worth? And so it's, the, it's the number one question I get is like, what, why is Bitcoin worth thirty thousand dollars? Exactly. Uh, what, where it was, you know, ten dollars, you know, a decade. Why is it so volatile? Yeah. What, yeah. What, <laughs> what gives it value? And, and you also touched on it earlier when you were talking about there are things um, around cryptocurrencies that uh, fundamentally challenge some of the legacy networks that we have in place. Uh, and what's really sparked that was. I guess Bitcoin's release was a challenge to the global financial system in terms of its decentralized nature, uh, its you know lack of central authority, um, and the fact that you can participate in this network, uh, anyone can participate in this network, and that's really an underlying theme through a lot of the public blockchains uh, and cryptocurrencies that that do exist is that they're very much anti-authoritarian, um, they're very much anti-centralized control, which uh, is 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 a challenge to many of the systems that we've been used to for so long, particularly the financial system. And so exactly. the idea of trust, who we trust, how we connect and interact with each other is a very important part of this because when we, we'll, and we'll, we'll touch on this a bit later, is when we start to get to, to different areas and industry uh, opportunities with all of this, um, is that ultimately we are talking about how we can transact and connect with other people. There's a very human element to why cryptocurrencies have achieved um, the, the notoriety, the awareness that they are today. And it's not really just about price. It's about how we can transact, you know, people in South America, Africa, Asia, even here in the UK. You know, I, I regularly have had issues with remittance and uh, currency exchanges from one place to another. Um, while there are fintechs that are that are looking at those spaces, I have absolutely found that cryptocurrencies is the easiest and fastest and cheapest way to transmit money from one country to another. So there's a lot of problems that they solve. The issue is that sometimes there's cryptocurrencies are a solution looking for a problem, um, whereas the the ones with some more fundamental value and longevity are a solution to an existing problem or looking to crack open something that needs to be cracked open. Um, yeah. like the, the, the citadels that exist in the traditional financial system and how we need to shake that up and, you know, really provide financial access for everyone in a, in a fair and equitable way. So, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I've yeah. probably opened up the doorway here to far too much, but that's that's really what, what's happening in this space is we're, what was cryptography and what was, you know, file and peer sharing networks and then the release of Bitcoin has now opened Pandora's box Mm -hmm. to a whole host of opportunities for how we can look at things like transport and logistics, how we can look at um, provenance, uh, collectibles exactly. and antiques yeah. and artwork, money, um, even social scoring, uh, medical data, data yeah. itself, exactly. privacy. There's so much that we could cover in this space. Exactly. I mean, and it's all opened up by, you know, the, the really, you know, ubiquitous use of this technology or people starting to, to use it very widely.
Um, I mean, I think you've probably, you, you know, Sam and I are sort of saying it, but I think it's probably best render it explicit that there are really two different types of blockchain network. There's the totally open network that anyone can join, and that's really underpins um, a lot of the cryptocurrency flavors of blockchain. But there's also the closed network um, var variant of blockchain. And these are the sort of use cases that businesses tend to favor when they're just dealing with other businesses and banks and regulators. They tend to pull together a closed network. They call it sometimes called a permissioned network and the value exchanges around the different members of that permissioned network. And again, as, as Sam was saying, uh, the privacy services then to bear because they, they can control who can see what. So for example, if Sam and Beth and I were in the same network, if, if, if Sam and I were transacting, uh, we'd be able to see the full details of that transaction, but Beth uh, wouldn't be able to see, wouldn't be able to see the details. We can actually use the the privacy services to control, essentially to give a controlled transparency within that network. Mm. But clearly, that, the, char the, the is, characteristic. Sorry, Beth. Okay, yeah, that, I was going to say, good. is that no, when no. Sam was saying earlier? You made a reference, Sam, to private and public networks. Is that kind of what you're alluding to, John? Exactly, exactly, and they're, and they're very different, and they have a very different set classes of use cases that go across them. And yeah. I think you know, it's not it's not just for blockchain; it's for any technology. You really need to we need to stand span, you know stand back and thoroughly understand the problem we're trying to solve before you know we apply the technology solution or solutions. I think that's right. And Ron has actually made a point in the chat. He's just said that as we as you guys have said, it's other technologies, and it depends on how it's being used best. So the, there seems to be this understanding of emerging technologies, but actually these technologies have been around for so long. It's actually how you use the existing technologies. And how, do, how would you say, guys, that people should be using these technologies to benefit their businesses? This is, more, this is obviously more general than us going into the sport industry, which we will do a little bit later. I, I, I think, I, okay, go on, yeah. Sam. No, please, please do. Um, it, 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 it depends, right? So like like john was saying the the advantages of, of private networks uh you, utilizing blockchain technology is that you also don't you know blockchains don't have to have a cryptocurrency in order to function um and you will find often with a lot of private networks that they don't use a cryptocurrency because it's really a, a, a digital ledger it's a, it's it's a digital representation uh of stuff that can be transported and transferred around the world um to you know to track um, and it's completely transparent, it's quick, fast, it's easy to use. Um, and so it depends, right? Um, there are industries, I know transport and logistics are really starting to look at how it can be used and have used it in the past. Um, the art world and, and collectibles is, and this is sort of where it's starting to blend into sport a little bit, um, which we'll touch on again in a minute. You know, you can you can track the provenance of, of something, you know, it's something that is, that is genuine, unique um, and, and a collectible. It, it it depends, it, and and I know that doesn't really necessarily answer the question, but there's 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 sort of the two sides of this coin um, are that there is no one size fits all solution. You know, Bitcoin isn't the answer to everything. Ethereum's not the answer to everything. Um, people that you know get very tribal about these things, um, but the, the fact is, is that there are companies out there, there are organisations out there that are looking to make profits for their shareholders or for their you know for their networks or organisations, and you know make public networks won't necessarily suit what they're trying to achieve, and then they need to look to you know corporations like I know IBM's done a lot of work with it, and there are plenty of others out there um, that that will utilise private private blockchain technologies and, and can help with those sorts of things. But particularly around finance and money um, and assets, um, even investing, you know, even something like the stock market, there's a really um, strong, uh, I guess, uh, potential for, for public networks to really crack open these what have what have previously been very closed door ecosystems mm. uh, are being cracked open now, um, and that's causing issues with those legacy systems and those legacy providers, um, and causing a lot of uh, misinformation. Um, and so we're in this sort of transitory period where you have uh, the use of what is relatively old technology in the scheme of things um, that is developing very quickly that is looking to shake up legacy systems. And, and that causes a lot of uncertainty. Um, people are worried. Um, and it's important to understand that this is still very developmental around how we're taking on some of these sorts of industries. 
Yeah, yeah. So that's a re totally, Sam. Totally agree. I mean, it's it's interesting on the, the business business blockchain space. I mean, some of the early projects we did in there were things like you know tracking the ownership of electric bikes. I remember us doing a project with the with the Dutch government in this space. So they were sort of saying from manufacturer all the way through to you know when it from retail outlet then to the then to the end user, uh, making sure that the insurance was in place for them. Etc. And also, this this became really useful if the bike was sort of stolen. But but again, as Sam was saying, you know, that's sort of taken on to different different asset types. Like there's a big project with Maersk actually tracking shipping containers around the world. Again, great example of a tangible asset. So that we're see, seeing where it is, who owns it, at what particular time, um, by rec recording a digital variant, of, a d digital record of it on blockchain. Um, also, the, the diamond and jewellery industry got very interested very quickly because they wanted to sort of track the provenance of diamonds. So if you buy a very expensive engagement ring from the jewellers, you can make sure that it's an ethically mined diamond rather than something that was grown in the lab or, or, or polluted into going through pollution into the supply chain. So all of those, you know, all of those are really neat examples of how blockchain, business blockchain can be used to track provenance. And I think um, NFTs, you know, it's a great example. And NFT is a great example of an intangible asset. It's like there are other examples, things like, you know, digital video, maybe a digitized advertisement would be another example of a, of a um, intangible asset. And blockchain's great at tracking those. Yeah, definitely. Think, exactly. Yeah. When you hear tangible and intangible, and when it comes into the sport industry, I've only ever really heard that when it comes to sponsorship and that activation side. So it's interesting to hear that that's been going on similarly. And I want to pop up this question, guys, because I think it's relevant to what we're speaking about. Let me just pop it up. It's from Daniel. Um, and he was talking about uh, relating to the private and public networks. Um, but what would be the most efficient existing blockchain to use nowadays? Let's so see. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you've got to ask yourself, what, is, what, do, you want to, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if all you want to do is create an, an, an NFTs um, and, you know, like, uh, let's just say you're, uh, you know, you're upper deck and you want to create a whole bunch of basketball NFT gaming cards, um, then you would, you know, look for the cheapest, most easy way, fastest way to create those, mint those, and have those distributed out to people that want to use them, and a marketplace for which they can exchange. Um, that could be there could be one of a dozen different um, blockchains or, or, or cryptocurrencies that are public, open source, uh, that you could do that on. Uh, if you wanted to create, um, you know, equity in your organization that you can sell to fans. Uh, which is something that the sports industry is, uh, it should be and is looking at, I'm sure, uh, then again, you would perhaps look for a different blockchain where it's um, more open to creating something like equity tokens or security tokens and ensuring that you can get the appropriate regulations and registrations in the jurisdictions that need that to be done. Um, so it is, it is very much a horses for courses. And we, when we were talking this morning, um, and John might maybe want to jump in on this, is that while we you know when you talk about this you, you all of a sudden start thinking well what if there's like a, a thousand different blockchains that everyone's using and they're all different from the other it's like how is that even going to work and in this space there's a lot of development going around interoperability so the ability for one blockchain to talk to another or talk to a network that isn't even necessarily a blockchain and so as we develop and go through this phase of understanding how things can talk to each other, somebody popped in a comment there about smart contracts. We can talk about that in a little bit as well when we get to the sport thing. Um, you know, the interoperability and how these technologies and networks can talk to each other, transact and interact with each other is going to be a feature that is going to be more prominent uh, in the coming years as well. Exactly, uh, Sam. That's uh, perfect. Totally agree. And I think there are two ways of addressing that. Um, first of all, there's the whole open standards debate. So um, if open standards proliferate, then it's much easier for blockchains to, to interact and integrate. Um, but there's a whole industry of different organizations who make it their job to actually connect different types of blockchain together and actually make them work together seamlessly. But again, if you think about that, that's, that's no different at all from other, other forms of system integration. It's been going on for years. Now it's being applied to blockchain. You know, surprise, surprise. But if 
I also just like coming back to the um, the fundamental question that you flashed up earlier, Sam. I think Sam said it, the devil's in the detail. I mean, you really need to stand back and understand the problem that you're trying to solve. That's step one. I would suggest step two. You actually look at whether anyone's actually already formed a network who's solving that problem. Um, like, for example, you know, if you want to if you want to exchange cryptocurrency with someone, clearly you can just jump onto a cryptocurrency network and exchange. But also, you know, there are there anyone can join this this um, mask uh, trade lens uh, shipping container thing, irrespective of, of you know. It's essentially the whole around blockchain use cases. You've got whole communities growing. So the first thing to do is actually look at whether the community exists already, and you know, evaluate using it. And, you know, only if you get nose to all of those, should you start thinking about, you know, do we get together with other like-minded organizations and start building something? Yeah, and, and there's an element as well around the security of some of these blockchains. And so the distributed nature of the public ones is important because the less distributed they are, the more inherently risky they can become uh, towards corruption from, uh, I guess, the... The concentration of, of those who, who validate and secure and, and keep those those networks going. So there's an element as well of, of network growth that um, is important for a lot of these networks. Um, I, you know, I, I use the, the analogy that if, if there was one person in the world with a telephone, it's not going to be a particularly valuable piece of technology. Uh, when you add two people to that telephone network, then all of a sudden you have a network and it exponentially grows from there until you've got millions and ultimately billions of users. And fundamentally, we're talking about the same sort of thing, the same sort of network growth is that um, what started small uh, is expanding. People are finding use cases for it. Organizations are finding use cases for it. Um, and there are some organizations that don't and won't need to use it. I remember in 2017 when there was a huge price run in, in cryptocurrencies and I was um, I had a meeting with a security, um, they were an online security, cybersecurity organization and they wanted to speak to me about uh, whether or not they should implement a, a cryptocurrency. And, and I just, I, I, I asked them why, and they didn't why? really have a good reason for it because crypto prices were booming. And I was like- They just heard about reason. it and wants to jump on the bar market, right? Yeah, and so look, and that's happening again, right? There are a lot of organizations that are trying to jump on this bandwagon of NFTs and go, oh, we're gonna get, we're gonna do NFTs because NFTs, right? Because, you know, NFTs. But realistically, you've got to take a step back and say, why? What's what's the point here? What are we trying to actually achieve? Are we trying to engage with our fans? Are we trying to make a quick buck here, which a lot are just trying to do, um, yeah. and, and really says because it can it can hurt your brand and it can hurt your organization if you get onto this in the wrong way with the wrong mindset and the wrong approach that you will burn your your users, your fans, your subscribers, your members, whatever it might be. Yeah, your as you say, your reputation. Your I mean, reputation can get yeah. crushed. In, in an instant with with this yeah. and because it's so developmental because the security for some of these blockchains isn't all that tight um, and because a lot of people are just jumping on blindly without really taking the time to to speak to the people that can can guide them in the right direction you, you know sam i in the early days of blockchain i often got used to get asked um you know is is blockchain based system more secure than a traditional transaction processing system i mean the, the way i'd answer is in, in a way yes because the privacy services are used so extensively that gives you a little bit more inherent security but it's never going to be um it's never going to be a a, a, way, a a way of working around secure by design you still need to design security into your system irrespective of which component it uses so yeah i mean i think it's a it's really important consideration but you know i'm also with you on the bandwagon jump in we need to avoid that at all costs it needs to be you know blockchain's right for a certain class of use cases and when it's right it's really good and when yeah. it's not right you know a lot of, a lot of money can be wasted <laughs> and i think as well as that again we've we've spoken a lot about different kinds of cryptocurrencies and blockchains and, and networks and peer networks here is that you don't necessarily have to use a blockchain in your organization but you can utilize cryptocurrencies or financial monetary cryptocurrencies as a medium of exchange as intended so we know a lot of organizations are looking to adopt things like bitcoin as payment methods uh, for you know for for merchandise or for memberships or whatever it might be, um, and there's you know so there are there are certainly use cases for all all organisations I think that we will end up with, and this is something that I've written a lot about is that ultimately the way I see this developing is that we will end up with something like Bitcoin or maybe Bitcoin or maybe not Bitcoin um, that we have as a universal reserve digital currency online, regardless of yeah. what central banks do. 
uh, is that we will end up with that as a as a flourishing system. But there was a there was a comment in the charts about can you comment about the recent decline in crypto prices? When you push the boat out a little bit and look down the track in another you know maybe 20, 30, 50 years, maybe even long before, long after everyone on this uh, session is dead, uh, that we won't be talking about it in pounds or dollars is that we will be using the baseline currency of something like Bitcoin and the conversion of other currencies to that as the underlying denominator there. And so that the entire supply chain from the, you know, the farmer that, that plants the seeds, he buys those seeds using Bitcoin. Uh, when he sells that, he receives Bitcoin. When he buys his tractor, he, he uses Bitcoin or whatever the, the ultimate currency may be. So when you roll that out through an entire supply chain, um, and into organizations is that we we stop talking about prices and we stop unnecessarily focusing on the price of everything in fiat converted currency. Um, this is probably opening up a, another Pandora's box to crypto and financial and monetary networks, which isn't really related to sport, but it is related to sport as well. Um, it is. And <laughs> it, it, we, could, we could talk about it for a long time. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> realistically, um, you know, when you're, and, and I know there'll be organizations probably watching this that are thinking about putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet as well as a hedge against deflationary currencies, like, like all fiat currencies basically in the world. And so all of a sudden, it's not necessarily that you're using a uh, blockchain technology in your organization to function, Maybe you do, um, maybe you don't, but you then all of a sudden need to think about this space nonetheless because something like Bitcoin that could become a, a good treasury management option for how you manage your treasury. Um, and so I think people need to take that, that, that level to understand about how it applies to their organization from how they can use it, but also how they should be looking at the wider uh, crypto economy as to the valuation of their organization and, and their own, you know, how they can preserve that or grow that or open themselves up to new users or subscribers or whoever it may be that are looking to interact and transact in this crypto economy. Yeah, it's all yeah, relative, some, right? Absolutely. Yes, very, very much. I, I was also going to say the other way of looking at it is also boosting trust in the distributed network. I mean, there's a there's a wonderful book by a lady called Ray, Rachel Botsman on it's, it's called Who Can We Trust? It basically says that we over time we've lost trust in central organizations like banks and governments, and that's been replaced by distributed trust. Uh, essentially, blockchain is a way of actually building that distributed trust, whether it's in an open or a closed network, it can actually knock the appropriate levels of trust between the network members because they're essentially sharing a business process. They're sharing a common way of doing something that's important to them. So boosting this this trust is a is a is another way of of looking at it, another way of answering sort of similar question. Um, I've I've also been keeping my eye on the Q and A, Beth. I mean, there's a there's a really good one in there. It, someone asks, it'd be great to know how to determine whether we use blockchain or not. I sort of see, oh, you've got it in the wow. Look, you've put it in there. Oh yes, we've got it up. I've been waiting to put that up for you, John. Uh, but that was quite, just, to be fair. You guys have kind of been answering this for Daniel. And there's another one um, from Ron as well, and he says you yeah. make it sound. I, I wanted to tackle that one. Fantastic. From Ron and it. what are the areas that we can be? What are the greatest opportunities? And I think you guys have kind of said it. It's all relative, right? You can jump on the brand wagon, but you need to really look at how your business, what your business model works and whether it works for your business yeah, or your I think, industry. Right? I think when we drag it to the sport conversation, which we should probably do uh, a little bit more now as I'm well, that, yeah. with the question from Ron, um, I think when it comes to sports organizations, the areas for opportunities are about how how organizations can engage with, with the, their stakeholders, which ultimately comes down to their fans, right? To the people that go to the events, that buy the merchandise, that pay for their memberships, um, and how they can best provide them with an, an engaging experience. So we know that NFTs have become a big thing. So for people that don't understand what that means is an NFT means a non-fungible token, which is ultimately a, a rare, unique, um, unchangeable token that is representative of one thing. Uh, a fungible token, which is something like Bitcoin, uh, can be divisible where all of them are exactly the same. So there are going to only ever be just under 21 million whole Bitcoins. A, a, a whole Bitcoin can be divisible uh, by, to uh, like 0 0.0000001, uh, seven zeros and a one, so eight decimal places. So in, in reality, with Bitcoin, there will the smallest denomination, which is known as a Satoshi, there will be 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis in circulation when all Bitcoin has been mined. 
So there's there's more than enough of that to be a fully fledged global financial system. Uh, the point being is that every single one of those satoshi is exactly the same as the other. They uh, they uh, it can be exchanged and there is no difference between them. But with an NFT, if you uh, use an NFT perhaps to represent a season ticket, for example, uh, there will only be you know if season ticket number one as an NFT, there can only be one one season ticket of that of that number if you know what i mean so when you you know sports organizations are looking at utilizing things uh, around cryptocurrencies then yeah you can use nfts it doesn't have to just be for you know minting some art or some merchandise it can be for um fan rewards it can be for even for ownership i mentioned it before around ownership of the club um it can be for a whole range of different things about loyalty rewards uh, about um you know, even how, how people spend money at um, concessions at, at sporting events, um, how they can, I don't know, the um, uh, Socios app through Chillers is using this to use um, fan tokens that, that fans can then go and do special events with players. Um, so there's so much in the sports area that you can utilize around payments, around fan engagement, fan rewards, ownership structures. Um, even contracts for players can be used with somebody mentioned earlier about smart contracts is that if you've got the right, you know, technical nows to develop the right kind of smart contract, you can build player bonus rewards into smart contracts. So if they score a certain amount of goals, the smart contract automatically pays out. There's so much that you can start to look at when it comes to sports and how you can utilize blockchain, cryptocurrencies uh, and and different platforms around this space that the greatest area of opportunity is is all of this and sport. I, I, I get really excited about it because I'm a mad sports nut from since birth. Uh, and then I, you know, sort of bring the two together and it sort of blows my mind about how exciting this space can be. So I think while NFTs is certainly the start of it, it is by no means uh, the end of it. It is it's just starting to scratch the surface of how sports industry uh, can really start to utilize this stuff. Yeah, and you yeah, brought exactly, up there, yeah. Sam. I know you brought up a technical term that I've heard my colleagues speak about, which is chilies. Now, when I heard that, I obviously thought it was food. <laughs> but chilies is a t what exactly are chilies again? Uh, so that's a, that's actually a cryptocurrency project that. Okay. Um, so the chilies token exists on their network, um, and they have an app, the Socios app, which has been launching fan tokens for. I think Aston Martin's got a fan token. I think the Argentinian football team's got a token. I think Arsenal was just announced as a fan token. Um, so they're using cryptocurrencies um, as and for fans to purchase and and to to use within those organisations. Um, there's a lot more to it, and I'm sure you know you have you have if you haven't already before had the the Chiles and Socios guys on before, uh, about it but um, they can obviously tell you much more than I can but that's just an example of how you can start to look at these technologies uh, to reach the people that are most important when it comes to sport and that's the people that that go to watch it exactly by far the largest body of people and yeah it's great way engaging them I mean, indeed, you know, sim similar to what governments are trying to do with with blockchain um, is to use it for improving citizen engagement. Um, so, you know, it's the opportunities there in sport. And I think the good thing about sport is that it's got lots of other industries that you can look to for exemplars of how blockchain could be used in anger. So I think, you know, thinking about what the business problem is, what the challenge is, and then looking at how other people have sort of like tried to solve it. I mean, the, the good thing about the different blockchain vendors is they um, they do offer lots of education material about the different blockchain types of solution. Um, and they're also on vendors' websites, on people like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft's um, cloud-based sites. You can even play around and experiment with, with blockchain technologies if you'd like to do so. Um, so there's lots of opportunity, once you know what the business challenge is, to find the right technical solution for it. Yeah, definitely. And we've got some we've got some more fantastic questions that are coming in. And I've just popped off it at the wrong time, which I knew I would do. So I'm really hoping that my colleague Joey is going to pop it up for me. Um, right. So we had one. We did have one speaking about sport, which came in from Peter. And do and do you have an example of where rights holders in sport have been successfully deploying blockchain across across its business? I know we have seen a few announced over the last couple of weeks. Have you guys seen anyone that's really been a pioneer in this space in the sport industry? 
Um, I haven't reading the question in great detail, Beth. I've not I've not seen one yet. Apply deploying blockchain blockchain across its entire business. I think this, the initiatives I've seen so far have been more experimental and proofs of concept. But I don't know, Sam. Do you know of any that meet that criteria? Um, it's 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 sort of hard to say because some have been utilizing uh, cryptocurrencies as payment for merchandise going back as far as 2014. Um, a lot more recently, we, we touched on it when I was just talking about the socio SAP and fan tokens with, um, you know, uh, the Argentinian Football League and, and you know, a lot of South America, um, a lot of Europe as well. It's starting to get into it. Formula One starting to get into it as well. UFC, a whole bunch of different sports. Um, I know uh, McLaren and, and Red Bull uh, have, uh, I think, struck deals with Tezos blockchain in order to mint NFTs using Tezos uh, that are greener, cheaper. Uh, easier to use so you know we're starting to see serious you know global sports brands engage with uh, blockchains with organizations involved with those um, and starting to explore how they can be used again through fan engagement um, when I talk about things like like team ownership um, and, and contracts uh, for players and all those sorts of things as well uh, that's still more experimental. I don't think I've seen great examples of that. I do know, I think it was the um, the latest NFL uh, number one draft pick, I think it's got a whole bunch of his contract structured in cryptocurrencies as well. So, you know, when you start to see young people filter through into sports teams and organizations that are growing up in a world where something like Bitcoin is the norm, uh, then I think we'll start to really see a lot more of this pro pro proliferate uh, around uh, sports organizations. I think I'll throw that back up, back a reverse question on from that one. Is that obviously sport is relatively new, but what other industries have you seen that have done it well? I know you brought up banking had been using it. I remember, I remember speaking oh, to someone about the music industry. Well, like yeah, they haven't done it well. But any industries that you've seen that actually have you have started to implement it successfully? I would jump on logistics. I think I know it's not really an industry. It's more like a cross industry initiative, and in that it applies. You know, most most every organization is part of a supply chain. And I think, you know, whether you're um, whether you're tracking food between the farmer and the fork or whether you're tracking diamonds from the mine to the jeweler or whether you're tracking shipping containers around the world. I think those were some of the more mature blockchain use cases that are in production in, you know, in real usage. Um, and I think, you know, a lot can be learned from them by just going and looking what's documented about them, although it's in a slightly different industry. Yeah, definitely. And I know that something that can go into the sport industry a little bit is IP ownership. And it was actually one of the first questions we got through. But I think now is the time it can finally come up on the stage. Um, so got asked, I would love to know the basic understanding of IP ownership, as it's very tricky to even start researching on it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not mm. even going to go there. I'm not an IP lawyer. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've got exactly the same caveat as, as Sam. Neither, neither am I. <laughs> I, I mean, I would say that you know, blockchain could be used to track IP ownership. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, it's a, it's, it's a sort of like you could view it, IP as another form of intangible asset. So, you know, actually keeping track of who, who sort of owns it, um, could be something a blockchain application. But the details, answering the question as written, <laughs> I think you need to get a, a, an IP lawyer. Yeah, and look, there are things with with IP, right? As well, there's always an argument against um, you know IP and trade secrets versus open source, um, and we're sort of starting to see that play out a little bit now as well. I think it was Shapeshift is a company involved in uh, cryptocurrency that is decentralizing their entire organization. How that works exactly, I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, I, I think and and I know Tesla open source all of their patents. Um, so we and I think Toyota have done it before with their hydrogen technology patents as well. So we're starting to see more of that. Um, there's a lot of stuff around uh, semiconductors. And I think it's the RISC-V uh, open source technologies, which are now starting to become competitive to things like ARM. So there's a lot around this open source versus IP and, and whether things yeah. should be protected and, and can, can development accelerate if you release those shackles. Exactly. And an awful lot of thinking about a technique called open innovation, which is, you know, it goes like, you know, organizations don't just lock down the hatches and do innovation on their own. They actually involve a network of organizations and take on board as many different ideas as they can and also open up their ideas, as Sam's just been saying. 
So yeah, yeah, open innovation certainly something that's worth having a look at if you're interested which, in that space. Which is really a core, a core sort of fundamental ethos behind a lot of the cryptocurrencies. Exactly. Open source, um, peer peer to peer, anybody can 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 get in there and and, and have a go, experiment, try, participate. Um, we've seen that a lot with decentralized finance at the moment, and I think we'll start to see more of that uh, come across the whole industry. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I know, guys, we could speak about this for hours and hours, but unfortunately, we're coming very close to the end of our session. And I've got to say thank you, everyone, so much for your questions. I know we're still getting a few trickling in, but Sam and John have both agreed that they will stay on for the networking session and be on one of the tables so you can actually ask them personally. So please make please make sure you take advantage of that later on. But before you both go, what would you what would if you had to speak to well you're getting an opportunity now you're speaking to people in this industry what would be your biggest recommendation in terms of this I'm assuming you're going to say research and make, remember that each business is different based on what you've all said throughout this but what would your main recommendation be as mine would be very simply thoroughly understand the problem before you even start thinking about the solution it might be blockchain it might be something else yeah and and I'd add to that you know pace yourself this isn't this isn't a fad. It's not a flash in the pan. It's going to be around a very long time. Uh, you should go through the right stages of planning and understanding how this can be properly integrated into your organization in the right way so that you are, are benefiting all stakeholders involved rather than just blindly jumping in and trying to get on that bandwagon. Um, forget about the price of crypto and understand the fundamental developments that are happening in this space and then start to figure out how you can roll it out across your organization. Awesome, and thank you guys. And before you guys run off, I know John has kind of got a little bit of a quiz. So we thought while we're getting ready for the next session, everyone everyone watching, I know I can't see you all, but if you can all grab your phones, everyone should now know how to do a QR code. If you haven't, I don't know where you've been over the last 18 months, because that's how you order drinks in a pub. So John's just posting it up right now. Basically, it's five questions. It's all anonymous, so we so we won't know if you've got it wrong, but we thought it would be a good little thing for you guys to have a go at. Plus, this is all about learning. So hopefully everyone's all got their phones out. Obviously, I can't see. I'm doing it myself. As I'm Hopefully, I've learned quite a bit. So it's worked yeah, for all me. The, all, all the responses are anonymous. Um, when you actually, when you've answered all the questions, if you submit the uh, result, press the submit button, then it says, you know, see the answers and the quiz app will tell you the right answer to the question. So it, it's like what university, John, which is what you do anyway. So yes, I'll exactly. ask you guys. Exactly, my day we, job. <laughs> exactly, so when we go into the next session, if you wanna share what your scores are, then that would be great. But John, Sam, thank you so much for your knowledge. And as I said, guys, these guys will be on for the networking session. Plus they have sent over some links if you guys would like to learn more about the books that they've written that they explained at the start. So if any of you guys want to learn a little bit more from John and Sam, please just put a message in the chat or you can email me and I'll send you all, all of the details. Or you can you can find me on Twitter as well. It's pretty easy, just Sam Volkering. Um, I'm on there quite a lot, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, on, Li I'm on LinkedIn more than Twitter. So, and there's only one John Paul Freeman, so. <laughs> So there you go, guys. You've all got permission to stalk them on social media. Yeah. So thank you so much, guys, for a fantastic first session. Thank you, everybody. And you'll be brought into the second session shortly. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks.